Um, Ms. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to both of our witnesses, and in particular to Acting Chief Pittman. I want to thank your department uh, and you for the valiant efforts to protect us, the Capitol, and our democracy during the January 6th insurrection, and also for the work you do every single day. And on a personal note, I want to thank you and your department for the recent efforts to bring to justice an individual who threatened me and my staff. But if we are going to ensure the safety of the Capitol and our democracy going forward, we must get to the truth and a complete understanding of what took place. My goal is to honor those officers who gave their lives, to honor everyone who was injured, terrorized, and traumatized. And I cannot get past a glaring discrepancy between intelligence received and preparation. So I want to start with the special assessment uh, of January 3rd. You testify in writing that the U.S. Capitol Police were aware that there were militia members, white supremacists, and other extremist groups who were coming to D.C. on January 6th, that they were armed, that they were targeting Congress and the joint session certification process, and that they were motivated by seeing this as the last opportunity to, quote, overturn the election. That is some who, what, when, why uh, listing. And you testified that this special assessment was widely distributed through the U.S. Capitol Police and to the Sergeant at Arms including that there was responsibility of sergeants and lieutenants to ensure that the rank and file got this vital information. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. You also testified that this special assessment was discussed at the January 4th multi-agency meeting. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And again, it was brought up on January 5th. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Mr. Blodgett testifies that on January 4th, January 5th, January 6th, the U.S. Capitol Police listed the probability of civil disobedience as, quote, remote, highly improbable, or improbable. My, your own testimony today says that that January 3rd assessment, quote, foretold of a significant likelihood for violence on the Capitol grounds. How do you rectify these two polar opposite um, analysis of the likelihood of violence? Yes. So those documents uh, that you're reading from that state that some groups were going to be improbable or, or less likely to incite violence is an, not even an assessment. It's a document that's provided by one analyst. So for example, there are several, there are hundreds of documents that are combed through by our task force agents. We receive uh, information through open source and, and from a number of sources that we have analysts that comb through that information to put together the assessment. So if, if I could explain it as being tiered, the special assessment is uh, the highest tier of assessment rating. That, that is the document that, you're going, that we are going to use as a department to make operational plans for any type of demonstration. So let me follow up on that. So your testimony is that to make operational plans, you were going with this assessment that you had that there were armed militia members coming, targeting Congress, and that was a significant likelihood of violence. That was your position. Okay, on yes. January 5th, uh, the Norfolk MB FBI sends intelligence that says in part, uh, 
comments picked up online that Congress needs to hear glass breaking and doors being kicked in, blood from their BLM and Antifa soldiers being spilled, and that there were maps being shared of the Capitol tunnels and facilities and rallying points for groups traveling to DC. It is disputed who saw this report, but you do not dispute that it was received by the US Capitol Police, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, and if I could just follow up with some additional on that Norfolk document. That document was sent the evening of January 5th. Uh, we know that it was received by task force agents with US Capitol Police. But I think that to put it in its proper context, that FBI document also stated that this is an information report, not finally evaluated intelligence. It was being shared for informational purposes, but has not been fully evaluated, integrated with other information, interpreted or analyzed. Receiving agencies are requested not to take action based on this raw reporting. So I think that I would consider that an additional document that would feed into the assessment that was consistent, but Capitol Police already knew. We knew that the white supremacist groups and militia groups were coming, and we did anticipate those groups being violent. In fact, you said there was a significant likelihood, and you had already looped that into the fact that this was going to be different and targeted at Congress and at interrupting the electoral college process. So now we have some disagreement about whether Chief Sun actually asked for a declaration of a state of emergency. Mr. Blodgett says his understanding from the former Sergeant at Arms, Irving, uh, that he says this never happened. But boy, does this look like we have a violent situation brewing. And you sent counterintelligent officers uh, to the rally that day. You must have seen the crowds that were gathering. You must have been gathering that intelligence back. That's in your testimony. Yet still we come down to this failure to be ready. That there is, you know, 140 helmets that are ordered. Maybe 126 National Guard might be able to come help when we are at a significant likelihood of attacks. And however we tear that FBI report, it fed right into what you knew already. So my question is in the end of this, and I see that I am out of time. We had white supremacy that's fueling the violence white supremacy that fueled the big lie about our elections. Do you believe that institutional racism, that a culture of white supremacy, and I'm not saying any specific person or one action, do you believe that played a role in the discrepancy between the intelligence received, the assessment of the likelihood of violence and the preparation that left our officers um, really uh, at the mercy of the mob. So as the first black and female chief of this department, I take any allegation of inequitable policing extremely seriously. I can assure you that under my command, uh, the USCP will continue to police equitably. With that said, I have no evidence whatsoever that suggests that there was any discrepancy uh, based on our security posture and uh, as it relates to making enhancements or not based upon race. Do you believe that um, Part of us moving forward on this, um, there are many things we have to do, technical and otherwise, but how are you going to plan in this new position with the morale being so low and especially for um, those people of color 
in you know our capital community on your force who see all of this through a very different lens and life experience how are you going to address this and get to uh, addressing institutional racism that exists in every institution we have here at the Capitol Police to ensure that this does not play a role in the decisions that we make? Absolutely. As the granddaughter of civil rights activists, a proud graduate of an HBCU university, and the mother of two African-American sons, I know all too well about the differences as it relates to policing and institutional racism. After the Black Lives Matter movement uh, during the summer, I spearheaded town hall meetings for the first time at U.S. Capitol Police, where I provided a platform for officers to express their concerns with law enforcement as it relates to race. We brought in speakers, chiefs from all over the country, and we provided an opportunity for officers to speak freely so that we could address some of those morale issues that occurred after the Black Lives Matter movement. I am proud to say that from those town halls, we were able to identify themes, working with our training services division, as well as the employment employment assistance uh, program to ensure that our officers have the tools and resources that they need to address things like institutional racism. We will be leaning forward with the executive team to continue to ensure that our officers remain trained up on things such as unconscious bias, implicit bias, but we will also pro be providing new platforms to address those uh, themes that were identified in October of 2020 last year as it relates to policing and institutional racism. Thank you, Chief Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Clark.